television highlights of the news of yesteryear. Taking Freedom's Tour. It's 1920, and in nation's capital, children from over all of America file reverently and curiously through State Department Library to have long and lasting look at declarations and documents of their country's claim to freedom. Among famed papers on display are Declaration of Independence and First Draft of Constitution. With nation recently embroiled in First World War, Doughboy's children see what daddies were fighting for. One war and 29 years later, Freedom Train stands on siding at Pengrove, New Jersey, as famed papers of independence come to the children of 1949. And getting second look at historic documents are boys and girls of 1917, now enjoying the sweet fruits of freedom as the voting men and women of liberty. Here's original copy of nation's all-important Bill of Rights. Here's President Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Bright words of hope and faith pronounced in midst of freedom's darkest days. Nations of children created equal come to traveling freedom train for loving look at scenes of their common heritage. Here's young America resubscribing to the call for freedom and equality of 1776. And now recorded for posterity is new America's endorsement of historic America's claim to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Handcuff King. It's the early 1920s, and here's Vaudeville's The Great Leroy. He's about to risk his life on street outside Parker's Theater in New York, so he signs waiver of responsibility. As eager hundreds watch, Great Leroy holds handcuffs he'll wear for horrifying stunt. Starting at bottom, he gets cuffed around ankles. Notice pumps worn in place of shoes. Seems as if one set of cuffs isn't enough for this stunt artist. He wears them with a half dozen. And with supposedly impartial woman finishing preparations, Great Leroy is now a little too tied up in his work to walk away from the job. Hey, what's this? A necktie party in streets of old New York? Nope, it's the great Leroy going into his act and getting up in the world to do it. Great One's claim is that he'll wiggle out of those handcuffs around his arms and legs while hanging by his neck six stories above the street. And there's no net under him, only the sidewalks of New York and a lot of rarely impressed New Yorkers looking up at him with their mouths open. <laughs> Now, watch him closely as he twists around. Going into spin, he goes into his act and gets out of those arm and leg loads of bracelets. The great Leroy is free, and incidentally, so was the great performance. Morgan's Gems. It's 1921, and here are some of odd gems and jewels given by financier J. Pierpont Morgan to American Museum of Natural History. Sporting lovely name of lapis lazuli, this is one of world's oddest, if not rarest, string of beads. These are called agate beads, once worn by some pretty French maiden in the fourth century. Closer look shows 20th century kids would call these merely marbles. From heart of California mountain, here's rare and beautiful rubellite, made by nature with tons of pressure and aeons of time. And here's 13 lucky pounds of aquamarine, sold by the carrot. And here are a few carrots cut. This colossal star sapphire is from Ceylon, a gift of nature's magic this is one of many fabulous marbles in startling stone, now in the American Museum of Natural History, 
a gift of J.P. Morgan. Barreling Cannonball Baker. It's 27th of May, 1920, and Irwin Baker highballs from New York to Chicago over what passes for highways in those early days of cross-country travel by car. Floodlights guide him through the night. En route, famed pioneer of auto driving gets good wishes from Colonel Woodson of Army, and after 27 hours, Baker ends thousand-mile journey in Chicago to get glad hand from Major General Woods. Here in 1921 is Pierre Monteur, most famous of all French orchestra conductors. With success on both sides of the Atlantic, Monteur is also a success with his family. Here at home, he enjoys admiring company of his charming wife and adoring daughter. After graduation from Paris Conservatory of Music, Monteur began professional career as violist, founded Société de Musique Moderne, then graduated to podium and everlasting fame. In costume for Shakespearean role, here's actress Peggy Wood as she looked in 1928, year she had starring role in Merchant of Venice. Also a vocalist in her early days on stage, Miss Wood takes leads in musical comedy from 1910. In 1949 was television's Mama. It's 1921 and here's New York's Mayor Hyland greeting Hollywood's Charles Ray. On silent screen, Ray won stardom as country boy who came to big city and made good. Now in real life, boy from tiny Jacksonville, Illinois, comes to New York as matinee idol of millions. It's May 4th, 1930 and fire blazing in forest land of Monmouth County, New Jersey, slithers like a sea of frightened snakes across acre after acre of maple, oak, pine, and elm. Fed by blazing underbrush, fire leaps to tops of highest trees and travels across the countryside on the long, leaping strides of a steadily blowing wind. Firefighters hoped this road would act as natural fire break but nimble flames hop over highway and forest on both sides of roadway is doomed. Here's how Holocaust looks from air as 50,000 acres, then 75, then 100,000 acres are in flames. Sudden shift in wind plus clever work by forest men and volunteer firefighters puts end to blaze by nightfall of second day. It's 2nd of November, 1921. At Camden, New Jersey, bus loads of home buyers block to housing development. Homes built by government to house civilian workers in First World War will now be sold by government to highest bidder. Auctioneer Joseph P. Day will put nearly 1,600 homes on auction block here in Camden alone. Buyers will get expensive and well-constructed homes for a fraction of cost, and government will get millions of dollars back in Treasury. Doing the impossible, test pilot Lloyd Child climbs into cockpit of Curtis Hawk 75A and adjusts oxygen tube for its 24th of January, 1939, and Child is going to test plane over Buffalo Field in power dive that most experts say will tear the plane apart and kill its pilot, says Child, oh yeah? At 22,000 feet, Child waves farewell to fellow pilot that might be his last goodbye. Down and down he goes for 13,000 feet. Here's meter and chart showing speed the diving plane attains. Hey, it's running off the paper. 
First dive produced speed of 575 miles an hour. Pretty good for 1939. Little Red Schoolhouse for Students of Beauty. It's March 1926, and here's typical phenomena of the time. Sudden interest in beauty is so universal, beauty experts open schools where would-be beauty parlor operators take courses in the tricks of the trade. This chamber steams wrinkles out of tired faces. And here, a student is applying hot wax, which dries and leaves clear neckline. Ouch! Beauty students learn art of deception. Your golden locks need not be all your own. Look, Ma, I'm just beautiful. Rod jumping, breakneck style. It's 1919, as at Seal Beach, California, youths who didn't have thrill enough in World War I get it here. And a year later at Antwerp, Belgium, world's greatest athletes compete in 1920 Olympics. Here's thrilling 400-meter hurdles. Winner for U.S. is F.F. Loomis of Chicago. And here's winner Loomis left with runners-up. Crowd watches fight for team honors between Finland and the United States. Pentathlon goes to Finland's Lettonen. And here's start of popular 100-meter dash. Runners are off their marks and down short straight away. Watch leaping finish by eventual winner. Who is that? California's Charlie Paddock, of course. And who wins meat? We do. 